out of the study guides for the book of Romans on Sunday night last week. My lovely wife and I made some more of those up this week and they are right over here on the organ bench. So if you didn't get one, come up after we dismiss today sometime while we're eating, grab you a study guide for our Sunday night study, study through Romans. You know, if there's anything worse than being laid, it's probably being delayed, especially when that delayment is out of your control. It's one matter to be the reason for your own tardiness, and it's something altogether different, however, to have something, to have someone that's beyond your control to cause you to be late. Uh, If we're honest, we just don't like uh, spending a lot of time standing in line. We don't like spending an excessive amount of time stalled in traffic. We just don't like to wait, do we? We don't like to wait, period. Uh, But increased information often promotes our willingness to sort of accept a delay. When we know why the line is moving slowly, it, it tends to help us just a little bit. When we know why traffic is stalled, it tends to soothe Our impatience, because increased information often promotes our willingness to accept delays. And one of the realities, folks, one of the realities in the Christian life is that it is full of delays. Dozens and dozens and dozens of times in the Bible, it commands us to wait on the Lord. One of the realities of prayer is that often we must wait for the answer. One of the realities of the way in which God operates is that we must wait for His intervention. And it's this last reality, it's this last truth that is at the heart of our story this morning. Pull your Bibles out please, pull out your note takers and we're going to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and it records one of the all-time great miracles of Jesus, one of the high points of Jesus' ministry, which was the raising of Lazarus. And I think this miracle, among all of the miracles that Jesus did, really exemplified what His ministry was all about. This miracle was the one that set the stage for His crucifixion. This miracle was this earthly representation of the heaven reality of how God often works in the lives of His people. This miracle teaches us how God often works in our lives today. Let's jump into it. John chapter 11. Look at verse 1 please. We are told there, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany. He was from the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So Lazarus is the brother to Mary and Martha and we're told here very plainly Lazarus was sick. And folks you all know how it is. When a family member gets sick, it's especially painful, it's often especially difficult to deal with. And when a loved one gets really sick, your world suddenly revolves around that sickly loved one. And that's what's going on here in the life of this family. We read there in verse 3, it says, Because of this, the sisters sent word to Jesus and they say, Lord, The one you love is sick. Now, let's stop right here just for a minute before we go any further into the story. There's two important facts here that I think we need to understand. First of all, the first fact right here is I want you to notice that the family notified Jesus of the situation. The family notified Jesus of the situation. You you could easily call that a prayer. They were kind of praying to Jesus. They sent word to Jesus. They're saying, Lord, Lord, our brother, we love our brother so much and he is very, very sick. We need you to come. We need you to come quickly. Lord, we need your intervention. So the first thing here is pay attention that the Lord, or excuse me, the family notified Jesus of the situation. Secondly here, the family reminded Jesus of His love for their loved one. Lord, we love Him. 
And Lord, we know that you love him too. Uh, Lord, we're, we're very concerned because we love Him and we know that you'll have the same concern because you know, we know that you love our brother just as much as we love him. The, the gospels show, by the way, the gospels show all throughout them repeatedly that the, the intimacy that Jesus had with his family, Jesus was very, very close to this family. And they say, Jesus, our brother, your friend is sick, and we're calling upon you to come and help. And Lord, we know that you will come and help because you love him just as much as we love him. Well, let's keep going in the story. Uh, verse 4 there we read, When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And then Matthew lets us know there in verse 5 that Jesus indeed, He loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So we're being told again, Jesus loved this family. And Jesus knew that these sisters were not being overly dramatic concerning the seriousness of the situation. But Matthew goes on to tell us there in verse 6, he says, Yet when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So let's slow down for a second. Let's follow the story. Let's remind ourselves of what's going on. The sisters go to him and they say, Lord, Jesus, hurry up. Lazarus is sick. Lord, we need you. We don't need you yesterday. We don't need you a little later on. Lord, we really need you right now. So that's the prayer, that's the request, that's what they're asking of Jesus. But notice the answer there in verse 6. It says that Jesus delayed going to Bethany. Jesus stayed where He was two more days. So Jesus got the emergency call, He got the prayer, and He tarried. Normally, folks, when you get word that, that a loved one is, quote, on the brink, uh, that it's touch and go, you, you hop on the next plane. You get on the next train, you hop in your car, and you go where they are. But right here, pay attention here, right here, my Bible and your Bible says that Jesus loved them and yet, He stayed where He was. Now, this truth teaches us two important lessons that we need to get here right at the beginning of the story. And that first lesson is this, ladies and gentlemen. God can love us and at the same time let us suffer. God can love us and at the same time let us suffer. But we, we object to that, don't we? Our objection is how could? How could a God of love let me go through a situation like this? But what we need to realize is that maybe, listen to me here, maybe it's precisely because God loves us that we're going through a situation like this. Yeah, preacher, we say that may be true, but I really don't need this right now. I really don't need what's going on in my life. But what we have to stop and back up and remind ourselves of is who is defining need. We may look at something and say, I don't need this right now, but God may be looking at us and say, yeah, maybe you do. Maybe this is exactly what you need. Friends, you can go into almost any pediatric doctor's office and you can go in there and they could be a line of kids filling up the waiting room waiting to get their shots. Waiting to get the shots for school. Now as the kids sit there, dread is coming over them, isn't it? And many times you can hear way back in the doctor's office when that child is about to get that particular shot, that kid will scream and wail and squirm and try to get out of the seat and try to get out of the room and run down the hallway because that kid has determined, I don't need this. 
Oh, but the parents know and the doctors know that while it may hurt for a moment, that they really need these shots. You see, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? It's all a matter of who is defining the need. And sometimes, now not all the time, But sometimes we have to suffer for our own good. Sometimes we have to suffer for His own good in order to give Him the glory. And so we're reading this story. Jesus gets the message and He delays. And this was a very serious delay. He gets the word in verse 6. Look at your Bible. Lazarus was sick. And then we're told there in verse 11, Lazarus has died. Now that brings us to the second important lesson. Folks, God can love us and at the same time let things go from bad to worse. You getting that? God can love us, right? Come on, do you hear like this? God can love us and at the same time, tarry. At the same time, remain silent. At the same time, step back. God can love us, and at the same time, let things go, allow things to go from bad to worse. And it was all downhill for this family. The situation was going, in fact, it had gone from bad to worse. So the big question for us today is, why does God delay? Why does God delay when you're earnestly calling upon Him? Why does God delay when the situation is bad and it's getting worse very, very quickly? Friends, why does? Why does God delay answering those prayers or solving those problems? Why does God delay fixing those circumstances or addressing that pain? Uh, I think lesson number one, one of the big reasons is Folks, God delays in order to demonstrate His sovereignty. God will often delay in order to demonstrate His sovereignty. And if there's any truth about God that you need to get, that I need to know, it is to fully understand His sovereignty. And sovereignty simply means that God is in control of everything. There is nothing that is outside the mighty, powerful hands of God. God's sovereignty means He's in control. It means He rules. It means there's absolutely no situation that He cannot handle. Sovereignty means that God has the final say-so on everything. Folks, Jesus did not show up because He could not get there. Jesus didn't show up because He decided not to go there. Now, verse 4 I think is key. Jesus says, listen, listen, this sickness, Lazarus' sickness, is not going to end in death. No, He says, it is for what you all can say it. No, this sickness is for what it is for God. Say it. God's glory, He says. So that God's Son may be glorified through it, Jesus says. He says here, listen folks, guys, people, (laughs) He says, the reason I'm going to delay fixing the sickness, is that God is going to use this sickness, use this situation to bring glory to Himself. Now, may I suggest something to you all this morning? Let let, let me submit something to you all. When, When you are calling on God, you're praying to God and you love God and you know that He loves you, and yet there is a delay in His response? Maybe you need to raise the question, Lord, how do you want me to use this situation for Your glory? 
Now I know, I know, I know it's so tempting to moan and groan and cry and complain. However, we ought to be asking if God seems silent, if God seems to be delaying, if God seems to be hesitating, we need to be asking, okay Father, what are you up to? Because I know you're up to something big. Lord, I know that you love me, so there's a really good reason behind this. And Lord, if you're not willing to change my situation, even though you love me, I know that you've got bigger and you've got better plans for my life. And folks, if God has delayed answering your prayers, it's not that He didn't hear. It's not that He doesn't understand. It's not that He doesn't love you. It's not that He does not have the ability. It's because God has chosen not to, at least for this moment. God has chosen just to wait in this moment because sometimes God's greater plan overrides our immediate comfort. And that takes us to lesson number two. God often delays in order to increase our faith. God often hesitates in order to grow our faith. Again, John chapter 11, verses 14 and 15 there. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let's go to Him. Now, let's be candid. There's a lot of confusing things in that verse, isn't there? I mean, compare that verse back to verse 4. Jesus said back in verse 4, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's He doing here? Jesus says on one point, this sickness will not end in death. And then we read in verse 14, uh, Jesus says, Lazarus has died. And then not only is he saying, no, 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 he's not going to die. And then Jesus ends up saying, no, Lazarus has died. Jesus goes on to say, you know what, and I'm glad. (laughs) Wait. Well, what does that mean? Well, what's he getting at here? <laughs> but, but I want you to notice the reason, folks. You've got to, we'll miss the whole point of this story. Notice the reason that Jesus is glad. He's glad so that you may believe. Y'all see that there? You see that very important phrase? You see that key phrase right there? He's talking to the disciples here. Now, now think about it. Why did the disciples need to believe? If they were disciples, didn't they already believe? Weren't they already believers? Well, yes, but Jesus is referring here to a deeper kind of faith. You see, folks, if you're going to experience God on a deeper level... You've got to go through a deeper situation. If we're going to experience God on a deeper level, we've got to experience God through a deeper situation. Follow me here. God says, if you're going to experience me on a deeper level, then then you've got to see me. And he says, in order for you to really see me, I've got to delay. And he says, I've got to delay long enough so that your situation will get bad enough so that when I show up, there won't be a question, there won't be a debate. It will be absolutely clear who I am. Folks, oftentimes in our Christian life, God comes to us and says, I'm going to delay so that you'll become so thirsty that when I show up, you'll not be able to drink of me fast enough. And I'm going to delay so that you'll become so hungry that when I show up, you'll not be able to eat of me long enough. I'm going to delay so that you'll become so lonely that when I show up, you'll not be able to hold on to me tight enough. Folks, God often delays in order for us to experience His presence and experience His power on much deeper levels. Verse 23 there. Jesus says to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. 
Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha says, Lord, I know there's coming a day in the future when I'll see my brother again. And that's great, Martha. (laughs) We agree with her, but most of the time we feel like verse 21. In verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. I always label verse 21 there, disappointment with God. God, why didn't you show up? Lord, if you had just been here, this would not have happened. I I was reading a book a few years ago on, on dog training. And he said and it was talking about how one of the first commands that that dog owners, dog parents want to teach their pups is the command to come. And the guy who wrote the book, he says, what happens is that dog owners immediately do the very wrong thing when you're teaching their dog to come. He says they'll they'll have their dog over here and they'll tell their dog to sit. And he says, and the owner is over here and they want the dog to come to them. He says, so what do they do? They say come and they start walking towards the dog. He says, well, when you say come and you start walking towards the dog, the dog just goes all dog crazy. And he starts running, bounding, and jumping, and moving. You know, the dog's all happy that you're walking towards him and he does his own thing. And the author of the book says, no, no, no. That's not how you teach your dog to come. That's not how you teach your dog to pay attention to you. That's not how you teach your dog to put his eyes on you and focus on you only. You don't sift the dog down and walk towards the dog. He says to get the dog to focus on you and you only. You set the dog down. You look at the dog and say, come. And he says, and then you walk away. And he says, then when you walk away, that goes, what? The dog goes, whoa, wait. Where's he going? He's going that way. I want to be with him, so I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to go with him too. That's what God does with us. Often God will delay. Often God will walk away. God will, will, will do something else in order us to get us to pay closer attention to Him. Lesson number three. Folks, God delays in order for us to see Him as we have never seen Him before. Look at verse 24. Martha answered, I know He'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her in verse 25, Well, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives there in verse 26 and believes in me will never die. And he asked Martha, Martha, do you believe this? Now hang here with me, folks, because we're going to go just a little deeper. God delays in order for us to experience Him on levels that we've never experienced Him before. God also delays in order to teach us truth on a deeper level than we've ever known God's truth before. You see, Martha, Martha knew some Bible. She says, I know that my brother will rise again on the last day. Jesus, I know Bible. Lord, I've been to church. I go to Sunday school. I go to Wednesday night Bible study. I've been told that in the last days the righteous will lie first. I've studied theology and eschatology. Lord, I know my Bible. And Jesus asks her here, you may know your Bible, but Martha, do you know me? He says, you can know your Bible, but when God delays long enough and you are sick enough, just knowing facts out of a book isn't enough. When you're sick, folks, you don't go looking for a medical book. You go looking for a doctor. When you're in trouble, you don't go looking for a law book. You go looking for a lawyer. There comes a time when book information doesn't solve your problem no matter how accurate the book is. What we need and what Jesus was telling Martha is we need personification of the book. In other words, we need the book with skin on. Martha says in verse 24, I know Bible. Jesus says in verse 25, Martha, I am Bible. 
Martha says in verse 24, But Lord, I know doctrine. Jesus asks in verse 25, You don't know who I am, do you? Martha, Martha, I am doctrine with skin on. Brothers and sisters, there comes a time in our lives when what we know about God must lift off the page. There comes a time when you need to see the God that you've been reading about. There comes a time that you need to experience the God that you've been learning about. Martha was looking for a resurrection. Jesus says, Martha, I am the resurrection. Martha was looking forward to a time. Jesus says, Martha, I am time. Jesus was trying to get Martha to refocus her attention from what she believed to who she believed. And Jesus says here, I am. Martha, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. And folks, that's the most profound name of God in the Bible. And we have to ask, what kind of name is I am? Well, I is a personal pronoun, and God is referring to Himself. Am is in the present tense. So God is saying, I am the God who always lives in the present. And brothers and sisters, God does not have a yesterday. There is no past with God. God doesn't have a tomorrow. There is no future with God. God always lives in the eternal now. You and I, you and I are like a child who are watching a parade through the knot hole in a fence. And we've got our eye looking through that knot hole, and we can see what is in front of us right now in the present. And we can remember what has already passed, but we have no clue what is yet to come. But God is like a person who's way above the parade in a hot air balloon, and God is watching the entire parade simultaneously. Because God is so high, and because God is so lifted up, He sees the beginning of the parade, and the middle of the parade, and the end of the parade, all at the same time. I am. God covers it all, friends. And that's what he's trying to get Martha to see. Everything with God is in the right now. God is a present tense God. God is always right here, right now. Because He is the great I Am. And God comes to us this morning and He says, I am whatever your situation calls for. If you're sick, I am a physician. If you're in trouble, I am a lawyer. If you need answers, I am a teacher. If you have needs, I am your provider. I am, God says, whatever your situation calls for. God comes to us this morning and says, Whatever you need, I am that need, and I am that need right now. So when we cry out to God, church, Lord, when are you going to help me? I am. God, when are you going to deliver me? I am. God, when are you going to change this? I am. God often delays so we can see Him as we've never seen Him before. You see, lesson number four. God delays in order to do something much bigger than what we had in mind. Martha, Martha wanted Jesus to heal Lazarus of his sickness. Jesus wanted to raise Lazarus from the dead. (laughs) And friends, if it seems that God is dragging His feet in your life, it's most likely that He is working up to something big. It's one thing to make a sick man well, any half-baked, half-hearted doctor to do that. It's something altogether different to make a dead man live. Only God, the great I Am, could do that. You see, the bigger thing that God had in mind here was to use this situation to officially spark the fire that would send Jesus to His death. Skip down to verse 46 quickly. Verse 46, But some of them 
Some of the people who witnessed this went to the Pharisees and told the Pharisees what Jesus had done. Verse 47 says, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, verse 48, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Here's my point in verse 53. So from that day, Day on. From what day? The day that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. From that day on, they plotted to take his life. This miracle, this resurrection, was the straw that broke the camel's back. So Jesus set up a scenario with Lazarus that would catapult Jesus into His own calling. Folks, it was the death of Lazarus that set in motion the death of Jesus Christ. It was the resurrection of Lazarus that set in motion the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, God is always up to something big. God is always up to something big. Y'all just say that with me. Come on. God is always up to what? Something big. Now I'm going to ask you, do you believe that? Come on, friends. Well, whatever you're facing around, right friends, I am not, I am not minimizing what you're going through. I am not minimizing your heartfelt prayers. I am not minimizing what keeps you awake at night. But I guarantee you, if God seems to be delaying, God is up to something big. God never wastes a moment. God never wastes an opportunity. God never wastes anything. So if you've been waiting for your answer, if you've been waiting for your change, if you've been waiting for your miracle, if you've been waiting for your deliverance, and there is a delay, it means that God wants to grow you up. He wants to mature you. He wants to use you a little more in, in the faith. I think I skipped lesson five, Mark. Uh, folks, God delays often because He wants to develop you. <laughs> I got a whole lot more to say, so just say I'm editing. John eleven forty three. says, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, <laughs> come out. I've heard preachers say it all growing up and I think it's true. I'm so glad that Jesus called Lazarus by name. You see, if Jesus only said, come forth, every person who had ever lived would have come out of their graves in that moment. Uh, folks, Jesus' word is so powerful that He had to specify, Lazarus, come forth. You're the one that I want. Brothers and sisters, uh, it's a powerful moment when God calls your name. Jesus was rousing Lazarus out of his slumber. Jesus was waking him up. Remember just quickly, remember what Jesus said earlier in verse 26? Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Friends, that's true. If you're a child of God, if you've repented and confessed His name, if you've been buried with Him in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, do you know that as a believer here today, you will never die? Sure, you'll leave this world for an eternity, but oh no, you will never die. The very second your eyes close on this earth, they'll be opening in heaven. While we are saying our goodbyes here, you'll be saying your hellos there. You won't be dead enough to know that you have died. Death is not a period. Death, my friends, is a transition. It has not appeared, it is a comma. And Jesus woke Lazarus up. And we're told in verse 44 there, the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Can you imagine? This had to be a crazy looking sight. He was wrapped up like a mummy. I mean, this was literally day of the dead. <laughs> he would have looked like some sort of zombie here coming out. Of there. And he'd been wrapped so tight, folks. Lazarus didn't come leaping out of that grave. He, was, he would have kind of waddled like a penguin. You know, coming out of there. 
I mean, he was wrath. And what does Jesus say in verse 44? Look at it, he says. The next 44, Mark. <laughs> Take off the great clothes and what? Let him go. Let him go. Whew. Man, isn't that good stuff? Come on. Man, that's good stuff. Could you imagine? Come on now. Could you imagine the conversation that Lazarus had with his two sisters in that moment? Can you imagine what they must have talked about? Quickly, remember folks, the miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. They've been building up on one another throughout this entire Gospel. Remember we started, Jesus started very silently and He turned water to wine. Very under the table, very quietly, very subtle. Then you got the healing of the official son. He came to Jesus begging. He humbled himself. Jesus, please heal my son. And then we get the healing of the lame man. <laughs> then we get the feeding of the 5,000. Oh, we get Jesus walking on the water. Then we get the healing of the blind man that we talked about last week. And with his seventh and final recorded miracle in John... We hit the pinnacle. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He starts soft. He starts easy. He starts quietly. And if you pay attention in John, miracle after miracle after miracle, we start with that turning water into wine and it turns into this crescendo. And right now with the raising of Lazarus, he's at the loudest crescendo, but that's going to lead him ultimately, folks, into the raising of himself from the dead. And once and all, he'll prove that he is the great I Am. The resurrection and the life. And he's asking you, my friend, the same thing that he asked Lazarus' sister. Do you believe this? Do you? For some of y'all, you do. And some of y'all, you haven't done a thing about it. I think today's the day to put action to your belief, don't you? Today's the day to put feet on your faith. Today's the day to step out, come on, confess His name, show that you're repenting of your sins. Let us baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't today be a great day for that? Let's stand, friends, and let's sing just as I am.